And I'm, I'm just going to read very quickly a few words from uh, Psalm 40. Um, and then basically off the back of that, we're going to listen to a song and I'm going to get uh, Paula and Amy to share just a bit about how their weeks have been this week. Uh, off the back of that as well, we're going to listen to another song, take communion together, and then uh, we're going to have David speak. Um, I hope David knows that because somebody asked whether whether, whether somebody's speaking. I was like, I don't have a sermon, but uh, I might need to Google one up if uh, if it comes to that. <laughs> yeah, you know, David reassures me that he's, he's got one, which is great. Um, so you don't have to turn to uh, Psalm 40. I'll just very quickly read a snippet out of it. It's, it's such a quite a, a long piece anyway. Um, but this is what um, stood out to me this morning. And uh, this is what the psalmist says. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Now I'd like us to start this this new week again um, with that thought in our minds about actually knowing that we can turn to the Lord and that the Lord does hear and he turns to answer us. Um, and so let's do just that this morning. Um, uh, if you feel like you need uh, prayers to be answered, you are in the right place. Uh, we'll pray together um, and we will wait for our Lord to, to turn and to hear our cries. Um, and also for us to actually sing along as well um, with one another in praise and adoration. Our Heavenly Father, we, we just want to recognize that it was your spirit that hovered over the waters at the dawning of the first day. It was also your voice that was echoing through the darkness that brought forth light. You are the God of all ages. Lord, this morning, accept our praise. Lord, it was also your love that birthed humankind and placed them in a garden. It was your hand that helped them to their feet each time they fell. Lord, accept our praises this morning. It was also your prophets who spoke your word to people like us, a rebellious generation. It was also your son, Jesus, who showed the depth of love that will not let us go. Lord, accept our praises this morning. You are the God of life. You are the one who enfolds us and your spirit fills us. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You are the God of joy whose sunrise wakes us and sunset amazes us. We praise your holy name. You are the God of hope, the God whose promise sustains us and the God whose power upholds us. Lord, we praise you. You are the God of love, whose patience humbles us and touch can heal us. Lord, we praise you. You're also the God of peace, who breaks down barriers and woes that divide us. We praise your holy name. You are the God of eternity, who has always loved us, and by your grace, you saved us. Lord, we praise your name. I just asked Paula to uh, play our first song um, this morning. It, it's from Matt Redman. Um, it's been ringing in my heart all week. Um, I don't know why. I hope I can figure it out this morning. It's there in the newborn cry There in the light of every sunrise There in the shadows of this life, your great grace. It's there on the mountain top. There in the every day and the Monday. There in the sorrow and the dancing. God's grace will find us um, wherever we are. Um, so at this point, I'm going to um, ask both Amy and Paula to kind of share how their weeks have been. 
Um, and also I specifically asked them to kind of give us some thoughts slash advice on how they are staying focused and also healthy during this lockdown. So not at the same time, guys, but if I can ask uh, Paula to go first um, and then uh, Amy, if you can follow on from, from Paula. I'll start with encouragement. So I've seen some real answers to prayer for people that I've been praying for, um, some in the church, some elsewhere, um, which is always encouraging. And some of them seem to almost have been instant answers to prayer. Like when David's been in the hospital talking to him, I've been just been praying that while he's there, he'd be able to have conversations with people. And he was on Friday able to pray with people that were looking after him in the hospital. And I just find that such an encouragement from what could have been such a really frustrating and difficult situation with his broken foot that out of it we he's been able to reach out to people that would never have been reached out to from this church otherwise and that's and yesterday morning i was on a partnership zoom call with leaders from other churches i just found that really encouraging hearing especially from one with the main speaker was from a church in Barnstable and just explaining how they'd grown from a very small church to now having three churches on three different sites with hundreds of people in the church and just some of the different ways that they they thought outside the box to reach out to people. They had people going surfing and speaking to people while they were out surfing and praying outside Tesco and things just different things that reach out to people and maybe just encourage us to think slightly differently it's not just coming into the building every Sunday and he also said that some of the two of the other two of the churches they planted aren't actually in church buildings and that has reached people who won't come into a church building but they will go into a school and have church in a school or in a theatre but there's something about a church that some people just don't want to cross the door the threshold and I was encouraged too by the EA Day of Prayer on Friday that we took part in as well. I think that was just really encouraging too. And this time in June lockdown, I've been able to work, which has been a big difference to the first lockdown where literally everything just stopped overnight for me. Um, so that's been good, but also frustrating in that I lost some work in the first lockdown and haven't been able to replace it. And it's you know, it's been a long time now, but you're just looking and looking and the right job just isn't there. It doesn't seem to be there, but I know that God has a plan and that the right job will come up. But I've just got to be patient. And so that's one of the frustrations. The other one, yesterday, I drove here in the morning. Car was working fine. It was raining. The windscreen has worked. Windscreen wipers worked. I got then after I'd been on the Zoom, got in the car to drive over to my parents and the windscreen wipers wouldn't work. It was pouring with rain. So I managed to get the car home because it's only sort of five minutes drive, but it couldn't really see very well. It wasn't particularly safe, but I couldn't really leave the car anywhere else. Um, and then I had to jump on the tube to go over to mum and dad's, do the stuff I have to do there, then get the tube all the way back. We just take so much more time and just yeah, frustrating but I think one thing I was holding on to is the verse that Mark gave us at the beginning of the year as a kind of verse for the year that we kind of haven't referred to for quite a while but from Philippians 1 verse 6 which says you know um, being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus and I think some of the things I've been encouraged by this week have made me think back to that verse and how you can see that he is continuing the work even in the circumstances that we're in and it's just yeah something that I just want to remind people of today. Um, so before Jesus left, or as he was going back to his father, as he puts it in his own words, um, he, he had left a means for his disciples to remember him. And that's primarily because he knew that being human, like everybody else, they needed something tangible to be able to remind them of his friendship, of his love, of his presence, uh, but also of his love for them. 
And in all of the Gospels, we find um, this section, which we call the, the Last Supper. Um, and with them, Jesus does different things in different Gospels. But in the Gospel of, 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 of John, um, he washes their feet and then goes on to actually tell almost like deliver truths about how they're going to live life. And in the midst of all of that, he, he says to them, believe in God and believe also in me. And that is quite important, I feel, um, for us this morning. Um, as, we, as we take bread and wine in the comforts of our own houses um, and rooms and ETC, um, that we take communion together as, as a reminder, as a deposit almost, of God's friendship, of God's commitment to us in whatever life circumstances that we're going to find ourselves in. So I'm going to encourage that if you have got your, your juice, your, your wine, your bread, your waffle, whatever it is that you're eating this morning uh, to be able to remember the Lord, that you take that, enjoy that, and just be comfortable with that as, 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 as God's promise to you and to me that life indeed at the end will be well with us. Um, so I'll just take a moment here to let everybody else kind of gather the bits and pieces um, and then I'm going to pray together um, and then if we can take communion to, together and off the back of that, I will um, ask Paula to play our communion song, and then we're going to have David speak um, from God's word. So uh, gather your pieces if you don't have them now, and then uh, if we come back in a minute or so uh, to pray together and, and remember Jesus, remember our Lord. Loving and gracious God, we ask you in the name of your son Jesus to bless and sanctify this food that we partake in remembrance of him, the bread and the wine. Lord, bless these things to the souls of everyone who takes them and receive them, that we might eat and drink in remembrance of the body and of the blood of your son. And also we take and drink, not just in remembrance, but also as witness to you, O oh God, that we, are willing to take upon the name of your son and always remember and keep him in our thoughts and in our lives as we go day by day and as we live each moment with you. Lord, we trust you and we ask that you might keep us safe and we ask that, Lord, we might know your touch and we might know your nearness and your love. And that, Lord, we might know that your spirit lives with us and dwells in our hearts and in our minds and in our bodies. Lord, we drink and we eat. In your name, amen. I'll ask Paula to play our, our next song.
Amen. Um, so I am going to now invite uh, David to uh, share with us from God's Word. Wonderful. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Paula uh, and Amy for sharing your message and for uh, sharing those wonderful songs. Uh, if you would join me in prayer this morning, um, and then we'll, we'll dive into uh, Mark chapter 7. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity for us to gather together. Um, as Harry mentioned, uh, seeing that sun break through the clouds, um, just what a reminder of your presence um, manifested through that light here in this earthly realm. Um, Lord, we're just so blessed to be able to gather together uh, in your name, Lord, knowing that where we gather together, you there, you are there joined with us. Uh, Lord, and what a what a blessing and honor it is to know that you are here and in and amongst us, Lord. And we offer you our praise and the highest glory today. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to speak, that you would remove anything that is not of you, Lord, and just that you would open all of our hearts and our ears to hear your message and that we might grow in our faith, grow in our relationship with you and become stronger uh, in our relationship with one another. And so all this that we pray in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As I said, we are jumping back a little bit. Uh, we're jumping back to Mark chapter 7. We'll be in the first uh, 23 verses of that chapter. Uh, this is what I was going to be speaking on uh, a number of weeks ago. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I had that accident. And so things shifted a little bit. Um, but I am very happy to be sharing this with you guys this morning. Um, so if you guys are willing, um, I'd like to go on a little adventure here through through Mark chapter seven, and we'll sort of bounce around throughout scripture. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going to just really quickly um, read the first little section of it, uh, and then we'll jump in. So starting in verse one, um, and I'll be reading from the, uh, the NIV this morning. Uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is unwashed. And then it says parenthetically, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Okay, so Jesus and the disciples are eating. The Pharisees are watching them like hawks, and they notice that the disciples don't wash their hands. Um, now, before everyone says, well, well, yeah, of course, you should tell them to wash their hands. Very likely they had washed their hands for sanitary reasons, but they hadn't done the ceremonial washing. Uh, and the difference here being that, um, one, the sanitary washing is what you need to do in order to get, you know, or whatever off of your hands. And the ceremonial washing was something that was established by, um, as it says here, the elders of the Jewish community who said, not only are we going to wash in order to be clean, but we're going to go a step above that and be uh, even more clean, which um, on face value, that sounds great. Like, yes, going above and beyond. That's fantastic. Um, we should all have that kind of mentality where not only are we doing the bare minimum, but we're putting in that extra effort. We're going that extra mile. We're doing that which um, is more than what's asked of us. Um, and so if we just take that, it seems like, well, maybe the disciples are doing something wrong. Maybe the Pharisees have finally come upon Jesus and the disciples and they're in the right. Uh, but then we continue in, in verse five and it says, so the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? And in verse six, he being Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And that's the problem. That's the situation that is the, the crux of this whole section here in Mark chapter 7. There's nothing wrong with going above and beyond. But the issue is when you're so focused on following the traditions of men, the traditions of the elders, as the Pharisees have admitted, 
rather than doing what God has commanded you. And so we see throughout the rest of this section, Jesus here um, addressing the Pharisees and some of the issues that he knows are taking place. So for example, it says, uh, Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But Jesus says, but you get around that by saying, I can't do anything to help my parents because everything that I would give to them is considered korban or considered to be set aside specifically for God. And so the, they're sort of doing a, a workaround, a, a sort of a, a, a tax evasion scheme, if you will. Um, this idea that it's not technically wrong because what they're saying, yes, if, if it is devoted to God, then it should be given to God. But what we see throughout the Old Testament, and you guys remember how much I love the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, we see God continually saying to his people the importance of taking care of the people around you, making sure that the orphans and the widows are cared for, making sure that those that are hungry are fed, taking care of strangers in your land, taking care of all of these people that have needs. God says that is of the utmost importance. You know, we see later um, in, in the scripture, uh, James will talk about what is true religion, taking care of orphans and widows. That is what God is looking for in terms of our understanding of how we live it out. And so here in chapter seven, the Pharisees are completely missing the point of what Jesus is coming to do in living here on the earth. He is not coming here to further ingrain the traditions that have been established by the elders of the Jewish faith. In fact, there are numerous times where he will butt up heads against that. Um, instead, he is coming to manifest that which has been prophesied and spoken of in the Old Testament, bring it out here, and continue it on into, uh, into the New Testament church uh, moving forward. And the idea being... <coughs> What we see perfectly encapsulated in the book of 1 Samuel, where we see that transition of kingship from Paul, the first king of Israel, to David. Um, God speaks to Samuel, who is um, the, the last judge and the first prophet. He says to him, Samuel, I want you to go and anoint the next king. Uh, again, bear in mind, this is while Saul is still king. Um, but, but Samuel does as God asks him and he goes to the house of Jesse and Jesse says, well, let me show you all of my sons. So he brings out all of his sons, um, and they come out and, and Samuel looks at them and they're tall and they're strong and they are representative of what you would picture in terms of a good royal king. And so Samuel in his heart thinks, surely this is this is the one who, who should be king. Um, and God responds to that and says, you look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And here we see Jesus having that same conversation with the Pharisees, that they're worried about the exterior. They're worried about the outside looking clean. They want to appear as though they are pious and religious and holy and distinct and set apart. But the way that they're actually living is just like the rest of the world. And again, this is the story we see throughout the Old Testament from all the way in the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel. They, they, you know, they both brought their sacrifices, Cain being the farmer bring the, brings the fruit um, and Abel bringing the lamb, but it's the intention with which you are doing what you are doing. God isn't just looking for you to do good things. There, but again, there's nothing wrong with doing good things. But God wants to know that the attitude of your heart is indicative of an attitude that is shifted towards doing it for God for the right reasons. Not just a matter of, well, I give money every Sunday. I don't like to do it. It bothers me, but I do it. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want your money. He doesn't, I'm, he does, he doesn't need it. Because God already owns everything. God can do miraculous things. What he wants is our heart. He wants our attitude. He wants our desire to be in following after him. 
He doesn't want us to look clean on the outside, but be filthy and ugly on the inside. He wants us to be clean on the inside and worry less about the exterior. But that is so countercultural, particularly in our modern era. Social media is all about you have to look good. You have to find the right filter. You have to spend 400 photographs to get that perfect one that you can put on your page so that people look at it and think, oh man, he's living an awesome life. He's living his best life. But God says, don't worry so much about that. Don't worry about the exterior. All of that stuff's going to fade away. What matters is what's going on inside. That is what's important. And that's what Jesus is trying to get at here in these verses. It's not a matter of the external, but rather the internal. Um, as you know, I'm, an Amer I'm American and uh, Friends is huge in America. Um, and from what I understand, it's quite popular here now. Um, but there's one particular episode where um, Joey uh, is going to go on a PBS telethon and help answer phone calls and, and, and do things in order to, to raise money. Um, and he is sort of like, well, you know, I'm doing a really good thing. Um, and, and, uh, but, you know, but I, I get something out of it. I get that TV exposure. So then people see me and maybe I'll get a job out of it. Um, but Phoebe is like, no, like you, there are, there are good things you can do without selfish intentions. Um, and so throughout the rest of the episode, she tries to figure out all these things. And she's like, I let a bee sting me. And they're all like, well, if the bee stung you, he probably died. So it's not really a good thing. Um, and then she finally, she finally says, she calls into the, the telephone and she, she donates the money. Um, and she's like, I, you know, like it, it's not, I'm not doing it out of selfish intention because I wanted that money for something else. Um, so I don't feel good about it. Um, but I'm doing it uh, out of, you know, unselfish means. Um, and then ironically, Joey is the one who answered the phone call. So then he gets on TV. So then she's happy for him. And then she's like, Oh no. Um, but I, I say that to say as humans, invariably we are very selfish um humans just we part of that is instinctual part of that is as a means of self-preservation if we don't if we aren't on some level selfish we won't take care of ourselves um but here god is saying uh jesus here is saying don't let that selfish attitude poison who you are don't let it become so much about you that you forget about what's going on in the world around you. Um, and I, I think it's so interesting that as we, as we read through this particular section, um, uh, we, see, we see Jesus calling out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and for their, their desire to look the part rather than be the part. Um, and, and, and later on in, in, the, in the last half of the section, he, he talks about um, it's not that which goes into the man that makes him unclean, but rather that comes out, that, that, which, that, that which comes out of the man, excuse me. And so again, talking about that heart issue, what is the focus of our heart? Why are we doing the things we're doing? Why are we saying the things that we're saying? Why are we living the way that we're living? Jesus is calling the Pharisees to a higher level than where they currently are. Um, and I would argue that we in the modern church fall under that same kind of um, misguided understanding. Um, that it's, it's almost like we have to live in such a way that we have to be noticed and it has to look a certain way. Our lives have to look a certain way. We have to have the perfect 2.5 children, uh, the white picket fence, everything has got to be just in line. Um, and it's more important to look the part again than to actually be the part. Um, 
But Jesus is, is speaking that that's not how it is at all, that that's not the truth. The truth, rather, is that it's more important that we are living the way that God has called us to live, even if it means the expense that we don't look the way that uh, the rest of the world thinks we ought to look. Um, and so I really find myself challenged in these verses to find out, okay, what are the things that I think are good things that I'm letting overtake that which I really must be doing? Um, there are some times when I really get caught up in a good book. Um, Harry this, this week has lent me a book and I have been uh, quite enthralled with it and I've been enjoying it. And there's nothing wrong with, re with reading a book. Uh, and it's particularly a book about, uh, it's called How God Became King by Tim Wright. So it's a great book and, it, and, and whatever. But uh, there are times when I'm reading it and you know there's, I should be doing something else. Um, the kids are as kids often do, wrestling with each other, and I ought to be telling them to stop, but I'm so focused on the book that I'm, I'm not paying attention to that uh, external uh, uh, activity going on right there. Um, but again, there's nothing wrong with reading a book, but it, it's, it's remembering what is our purpose? What is our role? What are we called to do? Um, and so here the Pharisees, as teachers of the law, yes, their job is to make sure that the next generation is raised up knowing the law, the Torah, uh, and making sure that they understand who God is and, and their, their relationship with him. Uh, but they're missing the, the important parts of the role and focusing on that which is less important. Um, and so really uh, just wanna challenge all of us to, to take a step back and process through that. What role has God called us to? And what am I doing instead of doing that? Um, whether, even if it's a great thing, um, if God has called us to do something and we're not doing it, uh, you can be sure that we're missing out on not only blessings, but on, on impacting someone's life who needs it. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of different religions all throughout the world. Um, and many of those religions tout this idea of um, the importance of doing good works. Um, uh, Hinduism, there's this, this idea of reincarnation where if you do good things, then when you die and you're reincarnated, then you'll, you'll move higher up on the, on the caste system and things. Um, and inversely, if you do bad things, then you'll move down. Um, Buddhism is about finding this inner inner peace kind of idea. Um, and you, you do that through good works and through good actions and things. Um, but a lot of these other religions are focused solely on the good deed itself. Um, and it's not so much an issue of the attitude or the means behind it, but rather just making sure that you do good things. Um, and even to an extent we see, um, we see Christianity fall into that, um, that it's in, you know, the, the importance of doing good things, uh, no matter what you're doing. But here Jesus says, don't, don't do good things if it comes at the expense of doing what you are supposed to do. Don't set aside everything for God and then not take care of things that you need to do and say, well, all of this, is, I'm just giving that all to God. And so I can't do anything with it. God in doing those acts towards those people that we are called to do it, we are in turn giving that to God. Um, but it's a matter of, um, again, I think selfishness, laziness, self-centeredness, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but here Jesus says, like, don't live like that. Don't, don't let that be your motivator. Don't let that control how you live your life. Um, and this is a huge issue. Uh, it, for us, it's a little less... Uh, like we, we, in reading this passage, we just immediately write it off. Well, the Pharisees don't get it because we don't have that same understanding of clean and unclean. Um, because now we live in a, a, a post Jesus, uh, a post new Testament era where, uh, there are, there is no distinction, uh, in terms of 
clean and unclean food. Um, and here, even in the scripture, you know, it, it, it parenthetically says, in saying this, Jesus makes all foods clean. Um, but for the Jews of this era, this juxtaposition of clean and unclean was almost central to everything that they did. Um, and the reason that that's so important is because of their understanding of their relationship to God. Um, again, it's not bad. It's not a bad thing that they had this separation of clean and unclean because in the Old Testament, God called that God called, excuse me, God called for his people to be holy. Uh, that's the Hebrew word kadosh. Uh, and it literally means to be set apart, to be separate, to be distinct, to be different. So what the Pharisees are doing here is they are being set apart. They are being separate. They are going above and beyond what the rest of the world does in terms of cleanliness. So they are living out what God has called them to do in being holy. However, Jesus is saying, don't let the semantics of that, don't let your legalistic view forsake those things that need to be done. Don't let it come at the expense of taking care of people that need to be taken care of. And that's really the crux of what Jesus is saying here. Don't get so caught up in the details that you miss the big picture. Because that's what Jesus, what God has called us to, had called the ancient Israelites to, to taking care of those people in need. To, to taking care of our fellow man, to providing that which we can, and to stepping into the role that he had given us. So as we process through this chapter, as we process through these verses, as we process through this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees, I think we often, as I said, we write it off and we say, the Pharisees, they don't know anything. They don't even know what they're doing. They're totally way off base. And I would say um, what was extremely prevalent in the American church was this complete separation of the Pharisees versus who we are as the body of Christ. But the reality is the further that we have stepped away from Jesus's time here on the earth, the closer these two groups have come together where it is almost unrecognizable, almost indistinguishable between the body of Christ and the Pharisees. Now, I don't say that, I don't say that for everyone. I don't think everyone is, a, but on the whole, the church is very much like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, that they miss the truth of what he's trying to get at and instead try to focus on the things that don't matter, but that they want to focus on, that they care about. Um, and so what we are seeing is Jesus calling us to something greater than that, wow. calling us to something more than just going through the motions and looking the part on the outside. Rather, he wants us to have a heart that pours out and flows out of that relationship with him. You know, I mentioned uh, the passage in, in, in 1 Samuel uh, with the, the, the new king. And ultimately, you know, we know that uh, finally the last son of Jesse comes in out, out of the fields working with the, the sheep. And he uh, is a scrawny little guy. His name is David. And God says, that's the guy. There he is. Um, and it's interesting that throughout scripture, um, David has the distinction of being referred to as a man after God's own heart. Um, and there's this fantastic song. Um, it's from one of the, in America, we, in, we have um, Christmas cantatas in, in Baptist life. And so there's a Christmas cantata and it, it sort of tells the story of Jesus throughout the whole Bible. And one of the songs is about David. Um, and uh, I think it might be a, maybe Chris Tomlin song. I can't, I think you can't think who sings it, but um, it talks about how at the end of the day, I want to hear people say, um, my heart looks like your heart. Um, and that's the encouragement that Jesus is giving us here is that we would have a heart that looks like God's heart. That, um, that like David, we would be men and women 
after God's own heart, that our heart would resonate with what he has called us to do. Uh, and so I really want to encourage you guys as we process through what this week looks like and the activities that we have and, and all the things scheduled for, for our week, that we would take time to seek after God and say, God, what do you have for me? What is the role that you have given me that I'm missing? What am I so focused on that I'm, that I'm not doing what you have called me to, what you have prepared for me? Um, because I know for myself, I would much rather be in that environment where I am following after God, that I do allow my heart to resonate with his rather than just trying to look the part. So I really want to challenge you guys to take time this week and process through what that could look like. If you would join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of relationship that you don't demand of us good works solely, Lord, but that you desire that we have a heart that looks like your heart, Lord, that you desire relationship with us, that you want us to know your heart and to know how we might live out the role that you have given us. Lord, I pray for each of us gathered here today, whatever roles, whatever plans you have for us, Lord, that you would make it abundantly clear that we would step into those, Lord, that we might give up some activities uh, that, are, that are stealing time away from what you have prepared for us, uh, Lord, in order to do what, what you would have us do. Lord, and I pray that we would each take time this week to re-examine our heart, to re-examine our focus and what we're doing and how we are living for you. And again, Lord, I just thank you so much for this time of fellowship, for this time to come together, to study your word, to praise your name, to lift up one another, to encourage each other, to support each other. Lord, even in these strange times that we have not forsaken this chance to get together by this means, Lord, and that we know that in, in, in doing this together, in living life together, we are encouraging one, each, one another and so I pray that we continue to do that, continue to reach out to one another via text, phone message, Zoom, WhatsApp, email, snail mail, however it happens, Lord. I just thank you that we, that we have those abilities and that we do take those opportunities, Lord. And we are so thankful for you sending your son, uh, Lord, and allowing us to hear the things that he taught during his time on earth. Lord, and the sacrifice that he paid, that we might be restored to right relationship with you. Lord, and it is through his name that we pray today. Amen.